Hello and welcome to the Biogenetics Monthly Webinar. I'm Dr. Brad Watts. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm excited to be bringing information to you that is going to change somebody's life. I know that every person listening to this has at least one patient that's gone under the radar with symptoms of hypoglycemia. And, uh, and the reason is, is that these symptoms mimic quite a few other issues. But today we're going to talk about how to assess and then how to move forward with these patients so that they can have some resolution uh, to their issues and then ultimately improve their quality of life because come on now, that's what it's all about, right? So how do we measure patients' progress? How do we measure our impact? And, uh, and it's by the smile on their face, resolution of their lab results, and obviously referrals. When a patient shares their favorite provider with their family and friends, there is no greater compliment. So anyway, this is that space. This, what we're about to talk about today, is uh, it's like a secret, and it doesn't need to be a secret. Like in medical school, in grad school, nutrition, chiropractic, etc., it must have been taught at like 7.30 in the morning, like they're trying to keep it a secret. <laughs> so anyway, let's pull back the cover on finding the faces of hypoglycemia. Let's get at it. Here's a disclaimer as always. All right, so here's the first question. What brings you here today? want to make sure that you get what you're looking for. So, solution to a specific problem, if that's what you're looking for, obviously you're going to find it here. Uh, how to application. A lot of patients, a lot of patients, a lot of providers know about their patients' issues. It's just how do you go about fixing their situation. And so, stuff that you're going to get today is going to be from webinar right into the office visit. You'll be able to take from A to B. And then certainly tools and strategies. Here's the one thing that I know. Right, is that you need to write down the things that hit you. Okay, write down the things that hit you. Oftentimes you find that a patient's memory will lapse. Oftentimes we find that a provider's memory is much better if they spend attention on writing things down, even if it's just a word or two. So write it down. It'll make a big difference in your ability to communicate what you've learned with your patients. And, uh, and obviously it's going to help both of you when that happens so all right the golden years here's a reminder from back in the day I haven't done this I bet in a year or two but I just wanted to let you know that the next 10 years the golden years in functional medicine and natural health care for you and your practice if you can do a few things very well number one systematize your approach to patient care if you have a system of analysis a way of looking at patients every single time they come in no matter what their concern is if you have a way of assessing them that gives you an opportunity to make sure you don't miss anything improve the patient results and the efficacy along the way one of the ways to do that or one of the ways to get different uh, perspectives on patient intake your approach to patient care is listen to the podcast nutrition hero podcast on itunes uh, i get to be on there and then we have a ton of different guests etc that share their perspectives and uh, i get to curate that podcast and it's pretty fun so create easy to follow programs number two create easy to follow programs this is important because if your patients can't follow through it doesn't matter what you know right only matters what you can get your patient to understand and oftentimes that understanding only happens with experience so sometimes they have to experience the program to be able to understand what you're talking about and it has to be easy to follow work with superior products efficacy is key and technology that sets you apart from your competitors. Obviously, when we're talking about technology, I'm talking about delivery mechanisms, and biogenetics is no slouch. <laughs> no slouch at all when it comes to improving delivery mechanisms for the industry. All right, so the next 10 years of the golden years, if you can handle these four things, and if you can handle them very well. All right, now, with functional medicine, obviously, everything we're looking at is all about perspective. Perspective is key. What happens is we get patients that walk in our door with a diagnosis, and most of the time the diagnosis is something that gets rubber stamped on their forehead, and then there's a procedure or a process of medications underneath that. Now, what they're diagnosed with, chronic fatigue, malnourishment, diabetes, thyroid disease, you name it, oxidative stress. What do we look for, though? We're not interested in the diagnosis. I want to know why. Why is that diagnosis there? Just want to know why. And you got to make sure that your patient takes it the right way when you tell them, I'm not really concerned with what, I just want to know why. And that why is key because when you understand the why, you can get the root, not just the fruit. When you know what they have, you're looking at the fruit of it. We want to know why, and that allows us to organize moving forward. 
So this instance with hypoglycemia is no different. No different at all. Hypoglycemia, the question is, is it real? Is it real? And there's some talk in modern medicine that says it's not real. It's just a manifestation of uh, the patient's mindset. It's a manifestation of mental health. Well, that's an interesting take, and um, I'm, there are lots of people that would <laughs> would fight back against that, right? Then you have the other side of it that says, oh, it's real every single time. There's one cause. It's the same thing in every single person that's experiencing it. But well, it's another interesting take, and it's obviously not the case. And so what we're going to talk about today is perceived versus documented, experienced versus referenced. We're also going to be looking at clinical hypoglycemia versus relative hypoglycemia. And, uh, and we're going to be talking about the different patients that you're going to see in your practice and, uh, and how to assess their situation. So the question is, is it real? From a symptomatic perspective, what we've been able to identify is that a typical association of symptoms to hypoglycemia is going to be increased sympathetic tone. And when we have sympathetic overdrive or increased sympathetic tone, there's a set of symptoms that go along with it. Sometimes it's heart palpitation. Sometimes it's a tremor, a fine tremor. Sometimes it's sweating. Sometimes it's dizziness. Sometimes it's blurred vision. And in most of the cases, if we're talking hypoglycemia-like symptoms, these symptoms are going to be relieved when a patient has food. Very key. Very key. So the question is, is it real? Or is it a sign is it a sign of an adaptation response? That's really what we're wondering. So uh, here's a research article. I'm just going to talk about, show you some of the things that are in the medical literature right now so we can kind of get the lay of the land and figure out where is this increased sympathetic tone coming from and what is the consensus right now in modern medicine. So uh, here's way back. We're going in the way back machine here. Diabetes, the journal Diabetes, 1981, back in the day. Comparison of oral glucose tolerance tests and mixed meals in patients with apparent idiopathic post-absorptive uh, hypoglycemia. Absence of hypoglycemia after meals. Now, what they found is the results showed that during an oral glucose tolerance test, blood glucose correlated with hypoglycemic symptoms in some subjects. Interesting. So they're saying it's there. It's a real thing in some subjects. But symptoms also occurred during a mixed meal, though glucose levels weren't significantly decreased. Interesting. So we have oral glucose tolerance test, right? Recognizing that blood sugar values are going to be going up, right? Blood glucose correlated with hypoglycemic symptoms in some subjects. But the symptoms, those same, those same symptoms, right? Those same symptoms that we're dealing with increased sympathetic tone also occurred during a mixed meal, not just a sugar spike, even though the glucose levels weren't significantly decreased by insulin after that meal. Right, so what does this tell us? It tells us that hypoglycemic symptoms in this study can, may, possibly are unrelated, possibly are unrelated to insulin. Possibly. Right, so put that on the table here. Possibly unrelated to insulin in case number one. We'll see what we're looking at next. Here's from 2006, a few decades later. Ambulatory blood glucose measurement, dietary composition, and physical activity levels, and otherwise healthy women reporting symptoms that they attribute to hypoglycemia. Notice the scientists aren't willing to jump on board here. <laughs> so what they have to say in their conclusion, subjects with hypoglycemic symptoms failed to reach chemically low levels of serum glucose repeatedly. Right. So first of all, the first study says that insulin may not be related to the findings. Insulin may not be related to that sympathetic overdrive. This study is saying that chemically low levels of glucose may not be related to that sympathetic overdrive. So it might not be insulin, and it might not actually be glucose that's causing the problem. Interesting. Interesting. Now, incidentally, just want to highlight this. How do you decide what's chemically low? Right? Isn't chemically low relative? Yes, it is. And I think that's where this takes a turn in an interesting direction. So this is talking about reactive hypoglycemia here in JAMA. Um, looking, the five-hour oral glucose tolerance test seems unreliable for the diagnosis of reactive hypoglycemia. And most patients with symptoms suggestive of hypoglycemia may have emotional disturbances. Interesting. 
emotional disturbances. Now, what they're referencing is it might be in your head. But what I want to do is I want to highlight that may have emotional disturbances aspect a little bit differently. Okay, What is one of the triggers of sympathetic overdrive? Stress. Right? What is a stressor in everybody on the planet? What's a stressor in their life? Well, emotional disturbance. It doesn't have to be like, oh, it's all in your head. Right? But what I'm saying is everybody's got a crazy relative. Everybody's got a crazy neighbor or a crazy kid or whatever it might be. And emotional balance or imbalance is certainly a contributing factor to sympathetic tone. In this instance, what they're finding in, in JAMA is that oral glucose tolerance test, the traditional way of understanding does a patient have reactive hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia in general, is not reliable. It's not reliable. So uh, inevitably, when you're talking reactive hypoglycemia with a patient, they're going to go to the primary care doctor. The doctor's going to say, well, let's do oral glucose tolerance test and see how you feel. Right? And that's my doctor voice. And, uh, and certainly... The doctor's going to run one, and the oral glucose tolerance test is going to come back normal. And the doctor's going to be like, you don't have reactive hypoglycemia. Maybe you should go see a therapist. Right? That's an, an important conversation to uh, predict for the patient. And the reason is the patient, can you imagine going to a doctor and the doctor telling you it's all in your head, and you're like, maybe I am crazy. Maybe I am like off my rocker when it comes to emotional balance, maybe I really do need a therapist. Well, it's a gateway into a bunch of other different pharmaceutical interventions that have nothing to do with organizing hypoglycemia, but it does have a lot to do with organizing the response to hypoglycemia, right? That sympathetic overdrive. So, I mean, and again, I think this is so interesting how so far in the research you have might not be insulin, might not actually be related to glucose. And the third one that says it might be an emotional imbalance situation. Yikes. Modern medicine coming in hot with zero answers for these patients, right? So here's the question. Is this for real? Is a hypoglycemic situation something that we can talk about with patients? Is it real? Here's the answer. Yes. It's absolutely real to the person experiencing it, right? We're not arguing whether or not the symptoms are real. What we want to talk about is the mechanism. Is the mechanism understood, right? And so modern medicine has the goal to place that in the category of, well, it's not real. It's not real because they don't understand it, right? It's not real because the researcher doesn't understand it. But there are doctors all over the country, medical, natural, or otherwise, that understand the effects of hypoglycemia are real. It's real. We just need to be able to make a distinction as to what's causing it. Is it physiological? Is it uh, sympathetic overdrive because of stress? Is it a combination of both? In the end, it doesn't even matter if the patient's experiencing it. You, as a natural health care provider, have the responsibility to figure it out, figure it out. So let's get into the identification process of this. Now, if we're going to name it, if it's going to have a name, then we're going to have to test it because, again, we're not obsessed with the fruit. We're obsessed with the root. And, uh, and the fruit is hypoglycemia. So here are a couple of things that you're going to want to look at in order to understand what's this patient's situation look like. Fasting glucose, number one, obviously you got to have a beat on that. A1C, which is looking at our blood sugar regulation mechanism over a 60 to 90 day period. That'll be nice. Glycomark, which is looking at our blood sugar regulation mechanism within a two to three week period for the most part. C-peptide, looking at pancreatic function. Uh, glucagon, we're looking at pancreatic function from a different perspective. Remember, insulin causes blood sugar to go down. Glucagon is going to cause blood sugar to rise. Fasting insulin, so we can have a second peek at what's going on with pancreatic function. And then oral glucose tolerance test, which is the medical standard. And I put that in there because in a clinical workup, if you're going to have uh, satisfy the standard of care, that still needs to be something that you're considering. Right Now, typically what I would do is rule out the oral glucose tolerance test with the other ones. Right, And so my, uh, my, uh, my findings with the first six would tell me, hey, I don't need an oral glucose tolerance test. If the first six come back within the normal laboratory limits and you're scratching your head, then maybe throw out the OGTT at that point. So identification is key. 
identification. So what I want to do is figure out what are we going to find. So here are a couple of different patterns. We have an insulin hypersensitivity pattern, which would be a relatively low A1C, a low normal C peptide, so low blood sugar control mechanism, A1C, normal insulin response, low or normal fasting insulin, low or normal fasting glucose. So the tanks are draining when it comes to insulin and blood sugar. Interestingly enough, we're looking at a situation where this type of patient is usually, usually uh, under the age of 40, female, very thin, usually has uh, a Caucasian, uh, Northern European, if you want to look at it that way, um, heritage. And don't be surprised if they tell you, I just don't like meat. <laughs> I just... I just don't like the idea of eating uh, something that had a heartbeat, right? And so they may be a vegetarian, they may be a vegan, and, uh, and it also comes along with uh, orthostatic hypotension. So that's your patient with insulin hypersensitivity. Think of it from that perspective. Next pattern is going to be somebody that has hyperinsulinism, hyper in too much insulin, with concurrent, at the same time, glucagon impairment, hypoglucagon. So when we look at that, you have a patient that has a low or normal A1C. Low or normal A1C. Too much insulin, low or normal A1C. Normal or high C-peptide. So the pancreas is pumping out a lot of insulin. Normal or high fasting insulin. Again, the pancreas is pumping out a lot of insulin. Fasting glucose value is relatively within the normal laboratory limits. Glycomark is going to be below 15, which means that we have instability when it comes to glucose excursions. If you want more information on glucose excursions, make sure to dig in on a glycomark webinar previously recorded in the education library. Glucagon below the pathological reference range. Right now, that's going to be your standard reference range on a blood chemistry. You can test glucagon. This patient, too much insulin, not enough glucagon. Too much blood sugar lowering hormone, not enough blood sugar raising hormone. Coming from the same organ. Interesting. So that's a pattern. Gastrointestinal. This is interesting to me because this is quite a few patients that you're going to find. Increase glucagon-like peptide 1. It's an incretin that stimulates glucose-dependent insulin release. Also suppresses glucagon. This is interesting. So what happens is, is you have GLP-1 that is too robust. It suppresses glucagon activity and causes us to increase our insulin content. That can happen with gastrointestinal issues. It causes increased gastric emptying, which means that the transit time from mouth to anus is very fast for a lot of these patients. And so think um, drinking too much orange juice in the morning and it causes diarrhea for somebody. Why? Well, if you have dysbiosis, if you have gastrointestinal imbalance where we have increased GLP-1, you're just gonna run in one end and out the other. This is a very common situation, very common, especially people that have um, an increased sympathetic tone already. Maybe they're nervous. Maybe they, uh, you know, are dealing with work stress or whatever it might be. Uh, that's going to increase the uh, gastric emptying effectiveness. Now, with uh, this gastrointestinal considerations continue, GLP-1 participates in the regulation of the HPA axis. That means that it's going to have a direct interaction with your sympathetic tone. It increases islet cell mass via neogenesis, and so we end up driving insulin production. Patients can also make antibodies to GLP-1, and, uh, and obviously that doesn't help from an autoimmune perspective. Patients with TSH, ACTH issues, LH issues, you want to make sure that you are considering their gastrointestinal needs are driving their endocrinology dysfunction. Gastrointestinal concerns driving their endocrinology dysfunction dysfunction. Very important. GLP-1 is the connector for that. Absolutely the connector. So with these patterns, all right, with these patterns, so far we have not enough glucose. We have too much insulin. So not enough glucose, hyperinsulin sensitivity. Too much insulin, not enough glucagon. And then and we have too much GLP-1. All right, so those are the few that we have on the table so far. The counter-regulatory imbalance is interesting. Low cortisol, cortisol is going to increase gluconeogenesis. So when cortisol is low, we end up with a problem. Low epinephrine is going to drive that sympathetic tone, that sympathetic pathway, and oftentimes 
um, can create can create uh, a situation where we have less than enough blood sugar, less than enough, low epinephrine. Hypothyroidism is another one, and then increased insulin-like growth factor one, which does increase our insulin activity. So these are the patterns that we're looking at here, right? These are the patterns. So number one, oh, here we go. Number one, insulin hypersensitivity. Number two, too much insulin, not enough glucagon. Number three, GLP-1 out of control. Number four, looking at the counter-regulatory imbalance. What's supposed to bring up sugar is not around. It's not happening. Not strong enough. Okay? So if we have all of those on the table right now, here's Miss Susan, 23-year-old female, 15 pounds overweight, diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, has orthostatic hypotension, has chronic IBS-like issues. She uses yogurt for the effect of the good bacteria. All right, so she's looking at yogurt as her probiotic, has orthostatic hypotension. What are some of the things that we're considering? Would you consider that this patient has insulin hypersensitivity? Highly likely. Highly likely. Perhaps this patient also has gastrointestinal increased GLP-1. Perhaps. Right, perhaps. Now, when we look at this, what happens, somebody that has any level of body fat to spend should not really be dealing with reactive hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia in general. Why? If you have stored energy, it should be an easy bridge into energy expenditure and regulation or balance. Right? Balance. So if blood sugar goes down, you should be able to spend body fat in order to bring your blood sugar up. But if we can't because of the uh, GLP situation or we can't because of so much insulin, which is a fat storing problem, so hypersensitivity of insulin, then this is what we get. This is what we get, all right? In incidentally, when insulin is around and it's a fat storing hormone and we're super sensitive to it, we don't tend to unload the storage facilities to use as energy. Right, those are diametrically opposed to each other and understand that process. Very cool. Now, here's Ron, type 1.5 diabetes, type 1.5 fasting insulin, 37. He has quite a bit of insulin resistance, I would imagine. A C-peptide. Pancreas is still working. It's a little, a little dysfunctional, but working. Glucose, 101, not bad. A1C does not match the glucose. And the glycomark is terrible. We have insulin excursion, or excuse me, glucose excursions happening here with this patient. Now, if we have a patient that uh, is dealing with fasting insulin of 37, what category do we put them in? Boom, right here, hyperinsulinism, concurrent glucagon impairment. Uh, we have these glucose excursions massively, massively. Ron, Ron needs some help, All right? Ron needs some help here. So hyperinsulinism is his trigger for hypoglycemia. Now, this is relative hypoglycemia. He goes into the doctor at 101, and the doctor says, well, your blood sugar is normal. Can't be hypoglycemic symptoms. Remember, their insulin sensitivity is relative. If his A1C is 7.4 and he's cruising around 155 to 165 for the most part, and you let him show up with a glucose of 101, that's going to be relative hypoglycemic compared to his traditional set point. Right? So it's relative. And that's the important thing. It's not going to be a pathologically low level of glucose. It's going to be a functionally low level of glucose for what his current insulin sensitivity load is at. Here's another guy. No medical diagnosis. 46-year-old male. 5'10", 247. Doesn't feel well for most of the day. Energy is mediocre and he lives on coffee. Holy buckets. 10 to 12 cups of coffee per day. These are patients from my practice, by the way. <laughs> so 10 to 12 cups of coffee per day. This dude, this dude's got some problems, right? He's got some problems indeed. Now, if you have normal adrenal gland function and you can tolerate 10 to 12 cups of coffee a day, I would suggest to you that you do not have normal adrenal gland function. You don't, right? Low epinephrine. Now, caffeine has a mimic uh, mimicry of epinephrine and it's going to cause an increased sympathetic tone and you're going to see a metabolic rate go up and all the stuff, right? However, when we have low epinephrine, those patients tend to live on coffee, live on it, right? And we develop a resistance pattern to it, 
resistance pattern. And so what happens is, is we end up driving up, right? So think with this guy, 510, 247, think metabolic syndrome. We end up driving up our insulin, driving down our epinephrine, living on caffeine, and we create a counter-regulatory imbalance, a massive one, right? So this guy has a hyperinsulinemia situation, I would imagine, with metabolic syndrome and the counter-regulatory imbalance. And, uh, and so he's a combination of both. And it's super interesting because you get to unwind the mechanism with these patients. But what a, what a spot for them to be in to try to figure out on their own. How are they ever going to do that? How are they ever going to do it? So, very interesting. So, what type of testing would we use with this guy, specifically? Okay, what are we going to look at? The other people had testing. This guy does not. So, what are we going to look for? Obviously, we're going to look for glucose excursions. We're going to look at their A1C and their insulin score. We're going to look at that glycomark is for the glucose excursions, by the way. And we're going to look and we're going to see how does this patient respond. If they have glucose excursions, then I know right off the bat we've got to be talking about glucagon. What in the world is going on with glucagon? What type of questioning do we use with this patient? How do we lead them down the road toward proper function? Number one, what's your breakfast look like? Oh, it turns out he doesn't. Turns out coffee. Coffee till supper. Right? Just living on coffee. Straight caffeine till supper. Very, very interesting. This patient is not rare, by the way. A lot of people that do this. So one of the things that you want to consider is making sure that you are asking the questions that lead you to the diagnosis. If the patient's not eating anything, how are we supposed to avoid that sympathetic overdrive? No sugar, all caffeine, increasing the metabolic rate. Maybe they have uh, an inability to process L-carnitine. Maybe they can't physically transfer body fat into the bloodstream in order to spend that stuff, in order to have gluconeogenesis. Maybe lipolysis doesn't work. No matter where you go with your questioning, the thing to remember is that you must work on a systematic process. There are no silver bullets. If you give this guy, oh, I know, you should just eat nuts all day, right? It's not going to fix his reactive hypoglycemia situation if it's related to insulin, if it's related to GLP-1, if fill in the blank, right? So you want to take a systematic approach by organizing your testing. On top of that, one of the things you're going to find is, is that dietary scheduling is key for these patients. Understanding that they can control their blood sugar with food rather than forcing their hormones to do it. Now, the hormones and the balance and the sensitivity of those hormones can return toward normal, toward homeostasis over time when they're not given such a, a strong task to complete on a daily basis. So basically, I would tell these patients, especially David, dude, it's time for you to control your blood sugar with food so your hormones don't have to do it. And in the long run, hopefully, you can avoid diabetes and the mess that comes along with metabolic syndrome. Dietary scheduling is key. Find the associated triggers. David's going to have to figure out a different way to entertain himself than with coffee all day. That's crazy. 10 to 12 cups. Like, that's enough for a horse, right? Glucose stability, the broad spectrum support that addresses the complete array of issues is a product that has been formulated by biogenetics called glucogen. Glucogen houses L-carnitine, two different versions of carnitine, L-carnitine and then acetyl L-carnitine, which with licorice root extract that's going to promote a proper response when it comes to that sympathetic overdrive and the nicotinamide riboside when we talk about creating blood sugar stability. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Right? If you've never utilized glucogen with your patients that have relative hypoglycemia, reactive hypoglycemia, or a functional hypoglycemia, you're missing out. This is a key for patients that are metabolically balanced on paper but can't lose weight. This is a key for patients that have symptoms of sympathetic overdrive yet can't figure out how to manage those symptoms. This is a key for patients that are getting beat up by an undercover condition that no provider is able to diagnose because it's a syndrome, not a pathology. We're talking syndrome, we're not talking pathology. This is key. Glucogen is amazing in that you don't need very much. Most of the time with patients, I find that all you need is one per meal. For most cases, 
unless their A1C is less than 4.7, 4.8 somewhere, in which case you might need two per meal. But the basic understanding that I have with patients is, is that if we need to increase, then we'll increase. For how long? Until you're balanced. And then we'll decrease once again, because ultimately the goal is not for you to just take a bunch of nutrition. The goal is for you to return to normal function. Homeostasis is key. Now, these building blocks are awesome because whether we're dealing with too much insulin, too much uh, uh, hypersensitivity to insulin, not enough glucagon, or we're talking gut disturbances in messing with glucagon-like peptide or insulin-like growth factor, what we're talking about is giving the brain nutrients designed to promote proper function by touching each one of those mechanisms. And that's what I love about this. So check it out, Glucogen, Biogenetics Product of the Month. If you have any specific questions, just email me, brad at biogenetics.com, and we'll get you taken care of from there. Thank you for watching this webinar, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>